point. That's a question I heard at a museum once and it kind of stuck with me. So this entire talk will really be a response to that one question. So, lady in the green sweatshirt, National Museum of London, this one's for you. Uh, <laughs> what is the point? Art really is a cornerstone of human civilization. It's part of what makes us human. And I often hear people talking about robots and sentience and these discussions, they always end on the fact that a robot can't gain sentience because it can't feel. You can't teach a robot emotion. They're beyond description. They're singular in that they are just that emotion. Uh, and I think this is really what art is an attempt to create. So let's move on to the real crux of what I'm talking about. There's this French painter that really fascinates me. His name is René Francois Gaslam Magri, and one of his most famous works is called The Treachery of Images. Now there it is on the slide there. I want all of you to just shout out one word that you think of when you see this painting. Pipe, surrealism there as well. Uh, so this is a painting of a pipe on a canvas, and underneath the pipe is written, this is not a pipe in French. And at first, it's easy to see this and think this is another one of those pretentious art house pieces that's minimalistic for no reason. But actually, it isn't. As the young lady pointed out, this is one of the most easily accessible pieces of modern surrealist art in the world right now. And I think what's so great about this picture is that it encompasses a really meta-artistic idea, the idea of representation. So what I love about this is that it's a painting that really confronts you. It literally asks you a question and makes you question it. It's like a really big dude. It's a big painting. It's 25 inches by 35 inches. It's on a big canvas. And it's like a really big guy coming up to you and saying, this is not a pipe, but is that enough? So let's go back to one of the great philosophical minds of our era, lady in the green sweatshirt, the National Museum of London, who said, but like, what's the point? Let's answer that question. Uh, I think this painting is all about art. It's about how art makes you ask questions, and it's how a single image can have and, and hold innumerable meanings. Um, the act of painting a pipe on a canvas and saying this is not a pipe on it wasn't to be pretentious. It's to really show that art is representative. And it's really quite literal. This isn't a pipe just like the Mona Lisa isn't a real person. It's a representation of a pipe. But why is that important? Well, because that's the baseline of anything artistic. These representations, these expressions, will ultimately inform and what people will look back at on past societies and civilizations. So that's one of the really important things about this piece. It's pure creativity, imagination, thought, emotion, it's creation, it's a sleepless night, it's a shower thought, it's a fleeting idea poured onto a canvas, and isn't it beautiful? And that's maybe what brings up the larger point that our great philosoph philosopher was talking about. So if you want to understand the importance of self-expression, you have to look at the people who create it. The act of creating something, I believe, is inherently selfish because all the greatest works of art really impact people. And it takes a selfishness from the artist's point of view, I think, to think that they have this unique perspective that will actually impact people. And it also highlights this symbiotic relationship that exists between the artists and the consumers of art. Art can't be effective, it can't be worth anything unless it affects people, and us as consumers of art need to be willing to let it into our lives and not be quick to dismiss it. And that dismissal of new perspective is what leads to ignorance, and at its core that's what art is, not ignorance, but a new perspective. Uh, similarly, there seems to be one of the main things that drives artists, artists forward is discussion and debate, and that's kind of lacking, I think, in modern society. Debate and discussion on a piece of art not only encourages people to express their own thoughts and opinions, but also encourages new ideas and perspectives to flourish. And also it highlights the sort of cyclical nature that exists between art and the artist. And that's another thing that's so great about this painting, where an art inspires art. And the most obvious examples of this that I can talk about is music. If you look back at how modern musicians were inspired by people that they listened to when they grew up and how that channeled their sound. You can even look back at the rock and roll movement of the 50s, 60s, and 70s and how bands like Led Zeppelin and The Who and The Rolling Stones were inspired by blues musicians like Chuck Berry and Muddy Waters. Those people listened to the blues musicians and what they were doing and they were really inspired by them and they evolved on their sound and in turn inspired a whole new generation of musicians. And that cycle really just keeps repeating on and on and on. I keep repeating the term self-expression, and I think that's because there really is no substitute that better encompasses what I'm trying to say. Art is self-expression, and all that means is that it's a form of creative output. 
we as people express ourselves every day. We say how we feel. If we like something, if we don't like something, we tell people. And we do this through language, and we do it through emotion. And at the crux of any form of creative output is a broader concept being expressed through an unconventional medium. And all unconventional is to say is that it's not directly expressed. It's a little bit like, this is not a pipe. It's telling you something. But truly, this is the most effective way of expressing yourself. Because if I have a point to make and I tell people what that point is, sure, they'll listen, but I can only keep them interested for so long. My reach is limited as a human being. And that kind of sounds ironic saying what I'm doing right now, but we'll go with it. <laughs> you know? um, but if I transfer that concept, the idea, to a medium that has the potential to stand the test of time and isn't limited by my reach as a human being, I'm empowering the idea. It becomes bigger than me or any one person. And why would you not want to do that is my real question. And maybe that also makes part of the point. Um, so one of the things that really stagnates and restricts our means for artistic um, expression is prejudice, prejudice against artistic mediums. You can look at developing art forms, and some have this stigma in them that the art created within them is inherently unartistic and isn't valued as highly as other mediums. And what this does is it creates this dismissal of new perspective that I'm talking about. And um, what happens is these newly developing art forms they don't have the ability to grow into something that people can actually respect, and the people that work within them are then, uh, they, they aren't able to create more than they, than they should. And when you approach these mediums in this way with this mindset of prejudice, um, you're really dismissing these new experiences and perspectives that the, uh, the art form has to offer. And the beauty of having, but that's okay, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. The beauty of having these different forms of creative out, uh, output is that it gives you, as a consumer of art, the choice. You can like things and you can not like things. That's fine. The problem lies when people don't respect the creative process. To say or imply that a, uh, that artistic medium has no artistic merit is to disrespect everyone that works within that medium and everyone who's found merit within pieces in that medium. And that again leads to that dismissal of new perspective and is ultimately bad for us as a society. So. In an exceptionally great New York Times article I read the other day, these two novelists, Thomas Mallon and Pankaj Mishra, discussed whether there was such a thing as low and highbrow art, terms I'm sure you've all heard before. And I won't spoil what they concluded, but I will tell you what I think. I don't really believe in the terms low and highbrow art. I'm one of those people that really thinks art is just what you make it. And the problem, I think, with these rigid definitions of art is that really it's such a personal concept and the emotion that I or you get out of any piece of art is solely individual to you or me and it can't be shared with anyone else so really who is any one person to say that one piece is more effective than another all any piece of art needs to do to be successful really is affect someone anyone it doesn't matter uh, so in that article Thomas Mallon points out that according to Wikipedia the term highbrow was popularized by Will Irwin, who was a reporter for The Sun magazine, and he popularized it in 1902. So let's talk a bit about Will Irwin. He was an interesting guy. He thought that people who were really intelligent had really big foreheads. So you can really see the absurdity of that term. My problem with these distinctions is that it's really a platform for artistic elitism and prejudice to thrive. There's a notion that consumers of lowbrow art don't look at highbrow art because they don't understand it. It's too much for their feeble brains to comprehend. But highbrow consumers will often look at lowbrow art to get a better understanding of what's influencing the vox populi and just to see and inspire themselves because you know they're above all of us. I think Alexander Herzen, the Russian writer, put it best when he said, art is not at ease in this stiff, overneat, thrifty house of the petite bourgeoisie. See, I don't know about you guys, but just saying that's made me kind of angry. But what do I know? I don't have a Wikipedia page, and Alexander Herzen has a very, very, very long one. Uh, so simply put, I'm not a fan of these strict definitions of good or bad art. But that's not to say I'm going to compare a drawing done by a child with Crayola crayons to a Da Vinci portrait. Technical skill can be measured. I'm not going to dispute that. But it never guarantees emotional impact. It doesn't matter how masterfully you execute your painting, piece of music, film, sculpture. It doesn't matter. It will never guarantee that people actually get emotion out of it. There has to be that emotional crux that influences it. And I'd like to end with a quote by Stephen Fry. He said, a true thing, poorly expressed, is a lie. And that really captures the essence of any artistic endeavor, you know, the process of finding a truth and trying to express that. And whether the truth is expressed effectively is really down to you all as consumers of art. You get to choose that. And I'd like to add on to that 
that any idea that isn't expressed is wasted. So I'd like to urge all of you to go out there, put that pen to paper, be more active consumers of art, be more active creative of art, and always ask, what is the point? But when you do, know that the only person who can answer that and who owes you an answer to that is yourself. Thank you.